It is no show place, this town. Not wealthy, not well known. Before what happened here in December 1944, or even since. For seven days, history paused at a crossroads in this Belgian Ardennes village and then passed on. Unless we can call history the echoes that ring in the memories of the men who make it, as they did in the battle at saint Vit. Not much time for sleeping, eating at irregular hours. The fact was that everyone and every unit was fighting for its own life. You're going to get it, so maybe this is it. Colonel, a C battery is firing at 150 yards. Cold. When you're cold, you stay cold. There's no way of getting warm. We've got no orders to retire. Und es war nicht möglich, etwa Servit meinerseits vom deutschen Angriff hier auszusparen. In the fall of 1944, the German army had been fighting for five years. Allied confidence was high, its strength overwhelming, and the halt in its sweep across Europe at the German frontier regarded as temporary. There, the forces of Field Marshal von Rundstedt held desperately, their calls for reinforcements answered by inferior materials or silence. General Siegfried Westfall, von Rundstedt's chief of staff, recalls these days on the Western Front as the most uneasy he had spent, until the day in late October when he learned the reason for the stubborn silence of the Wehrmacht High Command. Hitler received us and informed us that he was planning a large-scale offensive in the West in the near future. We were going to receive 20 infantry divisions and 10 panzer divisions, newly and completely equipped, and the land operations would be supported by at least 3,000 fighters. The target of this operation, which was to be initiated in the area west and south of Cologne, would be the capture of the port of Antwerp. Three German armies would launch the massive counteroffensive to split the Allied forces and capture their best port of supply, Antwerp. What would end as the greatest pitched battle ever fought by American troops, the Battle of the Bulge, would burst without warning on a quiet sector on the First Army Front. In December 1944, it was held in the north by the 2nd and 99th Divisions, by the veteran exhausted 28th and the 4th Divisions to the south, and by the newly arrived 106th, thinly spread at the center. Conditions were fairly miserable. It was intermittently raining and snowing. We were relieving the 2nd Infantry Division. We, as a brand new, young, inexperienced division were being moved into their position to take up uh, the defense of that particular sector. We were introduced uh, sort of ironically, as I now recall, uh, because most of the battle-tested veterans of the 2nd Infantry Division uh, kept talking to each one of the units of the 106, talking about what a country club uh, area this was to be. Uh, you would sit here uh, perhaps some few shots fired each day. I am Thomas J. Riggs, Jr. I was the division engineer of the 106th Infantry Division. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Patton. In December of 1944, I was a second lieutenant in an infantry company of the 106th Division. The division landed in France and went into the line that straddled the German-Belgian border about the 9th of December, 1944. Looking back on it now, I think Probably the division was just about as green as I was, and you couldn't be much greener. I was a second lieutenant just out of Fort Benning. The supervision of all preparations was in the hands of von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief West. Participants in the attack were the 6th SS Panzer Army under SS Group Commander-in-Chief Dietrich, 
On the right, the 5th Panzer Army under General of the Panzer Force von Manteuffel and the 7th Army at the left wing under General Brandenburger for coverage in the south. While the operation was being prepared, it was important above all to keep this a secret from the Allied forces. All movements were made during the night only. All vehicles in the front vicinity were wrapped in straw to keep the noise to a minimum. But nobody could predict how the situation would develop by December 16th. Von Manteuffel, Westfall, von Rudenstedt, Model. From the beginning, Hitler's generals saw no guarantee of success for the counteroffensive, but the Fuhrer was adamant. His plan was irrevocable. Its key elements were surprise, speed, and to prevent Allied air cover, bad weather, as specified in this basic order from the Wehrmacht High Command. The operation findet the operation will take place only under favorable weather conditions. These will be ordered by the Führer. These sentences induced me to call up headquarters and ironically inquire whether Hitler was now ordering the weather too. The weather did take sides. It was a harsh, confusing enemy to Combat Command B of the 7th Armored Division under General Bruce C. Clark. But the weather was a close ally of 5th Panzer Army Commander General Hasso von Manteuffel. General, I'm reminded of uh, December 1944 when you and I saw these beautiful green and quiet hills uh, all in covered with haze and mist and turning into rain and mud and snow and I can't help but think uh, how weather played a very important part in that time, as you knew so well. Yes. Ich darf daran erinnern, dass es ja ein Hauptplan war von Hitler. It had been Hitler's plan to start the offensive only during bad weather. And during the days prior to the attack, the weather actually was bad so that the German high command was afraid it might change to clear winter weather and blue skies, in which case your aerial combat forces might have stopped the attack in its very early stage. In fact, the weather on December 16 was just as you described it now. Visibility was bad. The advanced artillery observers, for instance, would have not been able to make out individual targets on the hills. Die vorgeschobenen Beobachter der Artillerie hätten beispielsweise nicht oben einzelne Ziele auf den Höhen erkennen können. But over there, as you will agree, the riflemen had shields of fire. The tanks were also able to recognize their targets at a distance of 2,000 meters. I therefore started the attack very early, at 5 a.m. as you know, to take advantage of the darkness and the bad weather, which would enable us to advance far into these hills you can see here, a typical Ardennes terrain, by noon. sort of academic on the early morning of December 16th. In this supposed very quiet sector, we suddenly found ourselves hit with an immense artillery barrage that included calibers of guns up to railroad carriage type, landing in all sectors, including the Division CP and Saint-V. Immediately after this barrage lifted, it probably lasted about an hour, 
I started to get reports from my various companies, uh, each one of which was attached to each of the three infantry regiments of the 106th Infantry Division. These reports were excited. Uh, they were, however, objective. Uh, they showed that we were being hit uh, by a fairly massive force. In the 28th Division's area to the south, the opening guns of the offensive aroused the commanding officer of the 112th Regiment, Colonel Gustin Nelson. I immediately jumped out of the bed, ran downstairs, and rang up Division Headquarters, which was then about 40 miles away at Wilts. And uh, I got a sleepy major on the phone. I asked him what uh, was going on in the honeymoon sector, and he said he didn't know. And I said, you better find out. I said, there's either a, a major attack or a raid in force going on there, and artillery's coming in like the very mischief. Even though we in the Division CP uh, thought we understood uh, that this was a massive attack, uh, we encountered great difficulty in getting acceptance of this information, or felt we did anyway, through our Corps and Army to our rear. I really believe that they thought that we were a young, untried division and were slightly excited. However, this same type of information began filtering back to them from our neighboring divisions, the 99th on our left and the 28th on our right. The ser seriousness of this situation finally became evident to 8th Corps later in the day, at which point they attached to us uh, primarily the Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division, Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division was led by General William Hogue, who was preparing an attack in the north that morning when his new assignment reached him. I then went to St. Beth and reported to General Jones, commander of the 106th Division. He told me that there was a, an attack all along his front and that two of his regiments were partially surrounded to the east of St. Beth. He did not have a very clear picture as to the nature of the attack, but said it was rather strong. He directed me to move to St. Beth as soon as possible. Later that same day, we were also informed by First Army behind 8th Corps, to which we were attached, that the 7th Armored Division would attack through San Vith to our east, and that we were to hold these routes, which were quite vital and a strategic road net in that area, free for this attack. This promised attack or counterattack by the 7th Armored Division through our position uh, is very critical because it influenced all of the the division's decisions from there on out. Since the 7th Armored Division was to counterattack through Colonel Riggs' position to the east, General Hogue was instructed to attack to the southeast when his armor arrived. There, another regiment of the 106th was cut off. But the 7th Armored Division was headquartered some 60 miles away to the north in Holland and there was little urgency in the cry for help that finally reached his commander, General Robert Hasbrook. It was a quiet day, but along about 5.30 p.m. I received a very laconic message from 9th Army which read, prepare your command for movement to Century. Century was the code name for the 8th Corps. I immediately sent for my G2 to learn the situation down there, and from the Shafe situation report, it appeared that it was a very quiet front where troops were sent to rest or to be indoctrinated, new green troops to be indoctrinated. After receipt of this message, I decided to send General Bruce Clark, who commanded Com Combat Command B, immediately to Bastogne, the headquarters of Century, 
to learn the situation and what our probable mission would be. I arrived in Bastogne about 2 o'clock in the morning of the 17th of December, reported to General Middleton, was told what he knew about the situation, which uh, I was impressed was not too much. And I was told that after I had had some sleep, I would go the next morning to St. Vith and report oh, yes. to General Jones and move my command there and give him some help. During the first night of the Battle of the Falls, the, infiltra uh, the enemy infiltrated between our lines uh, and into our rear areas. We didn't see very many Germans. Of course, now we know that they were moving in on both sides of us, that we had been almost cut off. Since the Schnee Eiffel is practically covered with trees, the terrain is extremely obscure. The young soldier hears fire from the right, from the left, behind him, and in front of him. Some people advance, others go back. There was quite some confusion, which facilitated our advance through the Schnee Eiffel toward Schoenberg. I met the first prisoners at noon on December 18th, on my way from the northern part of the Schnee Eiffel via Bleialf to Schoenberg. I must say they seemed rather confused. The questioning of young people confirmed that this was a division which apparently had been newly assembled, or at least contained a great number of men with no war experience. Von Kriegsunerfahrenen Leuten hier in Stellung war. Zwar war die Operation planmäßig angelaufen. The operation had been initiated according to schedule. The Seventh Army, attacking from the Eiffel front, gained a considerable amount of terrain. The Fifth Panzer Army, advancing north of the Seventh Army, had also gained some ground, especially since they had apparently managed to surprise the Americans along the entire front. On the morning of the 17th, Word reached Sam Vith of a German penetration coming from the east toward Colonel Riggs' position. The division commander asked me to set up, ordered me as a matter of fact, to set up a defense line astride the schoenberg Sanvith road to hold that road for the promised counterattack of the 7th Armored and uh, as an escape route for our two empty regiments to the front. The armor that might have relieved Colonel Riggs, General Hoag's combat command, had passed through St. Vith at dawn heading southeast on its mission to attack Winterspelt. The 7th Armored Division had left Holland before dawn, but its destination was Bastogne. There, General Hasbrook arrived well ahead of his columns, only to learn that the trouble was somewhere else. I proceeded uh, from Bastogne to San Vith and joined General Clark, who had arrived there some time previously, and we found the situation rather desperate to the east of San Vith. Smoke and noise coming from the woods about two miles east of San Vith indicated German tanks were there, and the only American troops between these Germans and the town of San Vith was a company of the 168th Engineers of the 106th Division. Well, I arrived at St. Vith at 10.30 in the morning, and General Jones needed help. Yes. Uh, then the problem was to get my command that was marching behind me turned off at Vilsam to come to St. Vith. Well, my greatest problem on the 17th of December was confusion and traffic on the road. Oh. Uh, your initial success on the 16th of December had started a lot of vehicles like supply vehicles, extra headquarters vehicles, and uh, service vehicles uh -huh. going to the rear. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This became so uh, severe at the road junction to the west of St. Vith that I had to go out and play military policeman yes. and direct the traffic to get it flowing to the front. And uh, I'm sure that you had the same problem because there's only one road from Prim 
toward St. Vit through the Ardennes. Genau die gleiche Situation, General. Ich war am 17. Nachmittag. Exactly the same situation, General. On the afternoon of the 17th, I was on my way to Schoenberg in a small vehicle, and I had to dismount because it was impossible for me to get ahead on this road. I then walked toward the front and tried to make myself useful as a military policeman. It was hopeless to try to untangle this column of vehicles when suddenly I heard someone calling in a very loud voice. Way up at the front, I thought I saw a military policeman and I approached him. I saw that it was my superior, Field Marshal Model, who had the same intention as I. So we continued our efforts together and tried to separate the column, but until nightfall on the 17th, a certain confusion and perplexity remained, since we were not able to separate the vehicles. Of course, General, you realize as well as anybody does that battle is organized confusion. Yes. Or at least the job of the general is to see that the confusion is not too disorganized. One human element in the confusion was 7th Armored Division Private Bill Dassinger. Sometime in December we were going down this country road and all of a sudden we come upon this great confusion. Jeeps, trucks, men, equipment going the opposite way. Well, you stop to think, what are we getting ourselves into? And a little while later on, we sure found out. Another was Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr. St. Vith, down a little kind of a side road. Now, at this particular time, the roads were jam-packed with traffic. All kinds of vehicles coming out of St. Vith. And we had to fight our way very slowly, mile after dreary mile, against this one-way stream of traffic. We arrived at a little town of Poto, which is a little crossroads Belgian village of about, oh, 10 or 12 small Belgian village farmhouses. 7th Armored Division Colonel V.L. Boylan was returning from Paris after a three-day pass. We came back in a Mercedes sedan which belonged to the commanding general at the time. And when we hit a crossroad where we would cut north to Holland to rejoin our units, we saw an armored column moving south and cutting to the east. It looked familiar, so we dismounted, went over and talked to the military police and found out it was our own division. Nobody would tell us where it was going, so we decided to follow it. The armored columns, like hundreds, thousands of other troops and vehicles on the 17th of December, was approaching saint vith Belgium. Converging from every direction, some came in pain and panic, some in cheerful confusion, some in desperate urgency. From the east, battered remnants of the 106th fought back toward friendly lines. From the south, units of the 28th Division were withdrawing before assaults of a magnitude no one could explain. And from north and west, the 7th Armored Division struggled on. Their arrival awaited with mounting impatience by General Clark in San Vit. Why this particular town? Why San Vit? Savit is really a very small place, and then it gained this tremendous significance. When planning the attack on Savit, we knew that it had to be captured at all costs, since it represented a traffic center, a junction of many, some six, eight roads, which cannot be bypassed. Savit had to be taken because all reserves which tried to attack the northern flank of my army, or the 6th Army in the north, had to come through saint vith just as you did. We were therefore very conscious of the importance of saint vith and had planned its capture on the 17th of December. And I proceeded to leave and to join my unit at saint vith Unfortunately, I was unable to join it that night. We were shot off two of the roads and returned and left early the next morning. And I saw that we couldn't get on to saint vith that night. So we went to sleep in a hayloft 
over a what was apparently a, di a dairy. The rest of that night was spent still waiting for the 7th Armored Division and reinforcing our position. General Clark formed a defense east of San Vies as fast as the troops arrived. They were fed piecemeal into this defensive line. And I fed them in to the point of the horseshoe, which was being held by Colonel Riggs and others uh, to the east of St. Fifth. This went on practically all during the afternoon and night and uh, all of my troops didn't close into the St. Vith area until 3 o'clock the next morning. Sunday night, we were fighting desperately to get ourselves in a horseshoe arc position around the town. This area was the nearest to the enemy, the eastern approaches, about 2,000 yards east of the town. American troops under the command of the 7th Armored Division attempting to hold the town away from them. I am Colonel Don Boyer, United States Army, at that time, Major 38th Armored Infantry Battalion, 17 December, 1944. The first arrivals were the reconnaissance troop of the 7th Armored, which I immediately deployed with their automatic weapons in this skirmish line that we'd established but placed them on the left side uh, overlooking the open field of fire where they could better utilize their automatic weapons. The rest of that day was spent assembling uh, any other support we could find. Uh, included in that support, by the way, were some medium tanks that we were able to uh, secure from the 9th Armored Division. Eight o'clock. Monday morning, 18 December, we were hit with our first attack. The Germans punched a hole in our lines. We counterattacked and restored the lines. Two tanks knocked out, one assault gun destroyed where the enemy losses in this attack. Between 11.30 and 12.30 on that Monday, the Germans again attacked us. At the end of an hour, our lines still held but we had started the long roll of losses. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. More than 50 German columns were now attacking through the Ardennes. There were penetrations everywhere. South of saint Vith, the 28th Division was split. Chaos ruled to the east where most of the 106th was surrounded. General von Manteuffel's forces were approaching saint Vith itself from three sides. At stake was not simply a town, but the timetable of the Ardennes counteroffensive. And it was already one irrecoverable day behind. Next, part two of the battle at saint -Vin. On the 18th of December, 1944, the conflict that would become the Battle of the Bulge was two days old. It had started with a huge German counteroffensive planned with a strict timetable. By the 18th, two Panzer armies should have reached the Meuse River, driving toward their objective, Antwerp. Instead, thousands of Hitler's finest troops were still fighting to take a small town in the Belgian Ardennes. A junction of roads and railways. The key to success for the counteroffensive was its timetable. A key to the timetable was Sam Vip. At dawn on the 16th, the massive German assault had achieved its first object, surprise. It had overwhelmed the inexperienced American troops in the forests east of Sam Vith, where some, like Colonel Oliver Patton, then a Green Lieutenant in the 106th Division, were still trying to fight back to friendly lines on the 18th. We made a last attack down toward the Schoenberg-Blayoff Road, and
And in that attack, I was hit for the second time that day. I was hit through both legs and I couldn't walk. Late that night, I remember the battalion commander came through and told us that the battalion had to pull out. He had orders to continue to try to break out back toward American forces. And they were going to leave us. There were four or five of us in the aid station. They would leave us with a medic. To the south, the German attack had split the 28th Division, cut off the 112th Infantry of Colonel Gustin Nelson. That afternoon, I received orders from Division, which was then at Bastogne, to fall back on Trois-Vierges and fight stiff delaying action, direction Bastogne. I knew that this was impossible. The German attack in this sector was being made by troops of the 5th Panzer Army. The capture of Sam Vith with its roads and railways was vital to their advance. They had been expected to take Sam Vith on the day before with little resistance, and on the 18th their commander, veteran General Hasso von Manteuffel, came up himself to see what was delaying their advance. Ich vermutete, dass es sich doch nur um einzelne I suspected the presence of scattered, though very courageous forces, which had come here from Savit or other directions to assist the fighting troops. I was under the impression that up to the 17th and 18th, these small scattered battle troops were not under centralized command. However, on the evening of the 18th, before nightfall, it became obvious that new enemy forces were approaching. Machten sich bemerkbar, dass neuere Feindkräfte im Anmarsch waren. The general surmise was correct. But American intelligence of the size of the German attack was still so limited that some units of the 9th and then 7th armored divisions hastily strung out to extend the American defenses from the original roadblock to a long horseshoe line were still unaware that even a little crossroads like Poteau could be vital. There, most troops had already withdrawn when Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr. woke on the morning of the 18th to word that a German tank was in the street below. So we raced around to my Jeep to get this bazooka, and the rest was sheer laurel and hardy. We couldn't get the strap off because it was covered with mud. Finally, we fought and got the bazooka unstrapped, and then we got it tangled up in, the, uh, in some camouflage netting. I was so excited that when I grabbed for the rockets, I took them out, and they dumped and fell down into the mud. Finally, we got everything all set, went down to the edge of this uh, long hedge, and here was a German tank, very thankfully waiting, just right there, waiting for us. We got the bazooka all set, started to fire at this tank, nothing happened. We'd forgot to wire the terminals properly. Finally, we got the terminals wired. We got off one shot at this tank. Big, uh, big explosion by the tank, but we couldn't see any result. However, the German officer in the tank closed down the turret and slowly backed down out of this little uh, Belgian town of Poto. The significance of any threat to the defensive horseshoe was clear to the man who was building it, 7th Armored Division Commander General Robert Hasbrook. Early on the 18th, I received bad news. The crossroads town of Poteau, which lay to the left rear of General Clark, up at San Beath, had been captured by the Germans. Since there was a road leading from Poteau directly to General Clark's rear, it was imperative that this be recaptured at once. Accordingly, I ordered CCA, my division reserve located at Beho, to proceed immediately and recapture Poteau. The northern front of Sam Vith's defenses was being held by the 7th Armored Division's Combat Command B under General Bruce C. Clark. It became apparent that a command post in the town of St. Vith was too far forward. And so in the afternoon I sent my aide back around to the vicinity of Krombach to find a place where we could move and move into a room where there were tables and chairs, a place for messengers and liaison officers to park, a room that could be blacked out so we could use it at night. The 19th of December was characterized by strong probing attacks by the Germans 
all around the defensive horseshoe. Most of these attacks were about one company in size and were apparently looking for a soft spot. On the southern front of the horseshoe, Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division found itself backed up against a deep railroad cut and embankment which could not be crossed. Its commander, General William Hoag, fought side by side with General Clark throughout the rest of the battle. In order that General Clark, who was on my left, would know what I was doing, I conferred with him and told him of the situation and that I intended to withdraw through St. Beth and take up the new line on his right after dark on the night of the 19th. This very difficult operation was carried out in complete darkness and was very successful. We were most happy that that had occurred some two nights later when the attack took place, which drove us out of the forward end of the horseshoe and took St. Vith. As the morning of the 20th dawn, we of the 7th Armored felt pretty lonely. We had enemy on all sides and on our rear. We were out of touch with the 8th Corps, which I later learned had been forced to retreat from Bastogne to Neuf Chateau down in France. Accordingly, I decided to send a staff officer of mine, Lieutenant Colonel Schroeder, to try and locate 1st Army headquarters and apprise them of our situation and ask for help. The defenses east of St. Vith still held. Their Colonel, then Major, Don Boyer, was in the point of the horseshoe. Communications were sparse, but they were sufficient to pass requests for artillery fires and exchange the necessary coordination for the attacks of the various battalions of the division as we received attacks from the Germans and kicked them out with counterattack after counterattack. Colonel V.L. Boylan was in the Horseshoe's northern curve. I can't recall too many details at that time of specific attacks because it seems that they went on around the clock. And the battlefield is a an extremely lonesome place. Uh, it's not milling with people. You don't see much. You hear things, tanks blowing up, artillery, small rounds, and things like that. For a private like Bill Dassinger, the battlefield was everywhere. Minute by minute, things change. I only know what it is to be in a just that little hole. Maybe a squad or two around us. That's all we know. We know that little bit of territory that we have. You were constantly getting rumors. I remember one time we heard that the brightest spot on the Western Front was St. Beth. Many men believed the rumors that different units had pulled out and in turn were panicked. I remember reading one of Jim Thurber's book stories, which is entitled the day the dam broke. And it seemed so apropos to this situation that I ask every member of my staff to read that book and take it to heart. Continued attacks went on during the day on both of the combat command Bs. And my G2 towards the end of the day told me that we had prisoners of war in our prisoner of war enclosure who were identified from five German divisions. This seemed impossible to me, but later events proved it to be correct. The defensive horseshoe was now a good 25 miles long, reinforced by Colonel Nelson's regiment that had lost touch with its division. But the line was being pounded from a horseshoe into a fortified goose egg. Lieutenant Patton knew why. He was riding wounded on the hood of a jeep driven by a German officer back toward a German aid station. There were two things going on on that road that even a lieutenant as green as I was could uh, add up and make sense out of. First thing, of course, was the number of troops moving west along that road, infantry on either side of the road, and the other was the number of vehicles coming down. Tanks, trucks, flak wagons, cars. And they were the biggest tanks I'd ever seen in my life. Every time one of those tanks would go by, I'd look at it, and Lieutenant would lean over and look at me and grin. As I occupied my positions here on the east, on the night of the 20th, 21st, snow flurries in the air, all of us 
with frostbite, some with frozen fingers and frozen legs. To our front, to our right flank, to our left flank, all night long, we heard the noise of trucks and the noise of tanks moving into position. At last, a long-delayed, coordinated German attack on Saint-Vith fell. But General Hasbrook searched for First Army headquarters, and his efforts to convince them that he was facing more than a local German counterattack had been successful. On the morning of the 21st, we were overjoyed to find that the 82nd Airborne had arrived in our general vicinity and had made a tenuous contact with us near the Vilsam Bridge. This was an eventful day in our sector. CCB of the 7th Armored was attacked by a full German corps. By noon, heavy concentrations of artillery started breaking on the woods in which my forces were located. Screaming Mimi barrages started. These sounded like a huge spring being compressed and then suddenly cut loose. It was a horrible din that came through the air down among the trees. I remember one unit commander who I had who several times reported to me that he had to be relieved or had to have reinforcements that he could only hold maybe another hour or sometimes three hours or sometimes eight hours. I remember telling him very definitely that saying, how the hell do you know how long can you hold? You just hold there as long as you have the ability to fire back. Time meant nothing to me. But between 1,200 and 1,300 on the 21st until 2,300 hours or 11 o'clock that night, I saw my own immediate force, which had been in the neighborhood of 680 men, go to less than 200. The eastern point in the horseshoe defending Saint Vith was now an island defending only itself. There, Colonel Thomas J. Riggs, the 106th Division engineer, whose roadblock had been the town's first defense, still held the road under his original orders. By that evening, the Germans were building up their intensity and were starting to break through on both of our flanks. By about midnight, we'd lost communication on both flanks with the two units, so we knew we were being completely isolated. Knowing that Sanvith now was filled with German troops coming in from the east, the north, and the south. I peeled off to the right until we got in the vicinity of the road that led to Prum. And there we broke off into five and eight man groups. I gave them a compass bearing and told them to try to work their way to the west to rejoin General Clark, Combat Command B, where we might continue the fight. For by nightfall, I and the four men in my group were prisoners of the Germans. And I realized that in the furious fight in the day before that I had been wounded And for me, the world had come to an end at that point. Uh, we could then, in the dawn's light, see that all of the roads leading into Sanvith were full of German troops uh, concentrating on and going through uh, Sanvith. We obviously could not counterattack. I attempted at that time to split them up into patrols so they could uh, attempt to work their way back to the friendly lines, the U.S. lines. We started two of these patrols out and watched both of them captured. And shortly thereafter, uh, I was captured with the remainder of the group. In the afternoon of 21st December, General Clark informed me that the attack on St. Beth was becoming so heavy they would be forced out of that position that evening and said he would retreat to the west. 
I agreed to conform with his movement. The Syria, also oddly a sight for lust. The tremendous delay we had suffered so far in my schedule left its mark on the whole army, in the Central Corps as well as in the Southern Sector. Deshalb waren meine Anstrengungen bis zum 22. Dezember dahin gerichtet. Until December 22nd, therefore, my efforts were concentrated on the coordination of the attack on Saint-Vit, in other words, the cooperation of all arms, the infantry, the storm guns, the artillery, the tanks, in a final attempt to take Saint-Vit. And you see how great the difficulties were to coordinate this attack. Am 21. 22. gelungen, so dass wir dann zum Krieg endgültig in Besitz nehmen konnten. Aber der Zeitverlust war groß und daher die Bedeutung ihrer Verteidigung von St. Fit. As I remember the 22nd of December, I remember it as a day of mud and rain and considerable confusion. As you pressed your attack in the morning of the 22nd against our new defensive line in the Kronbach area. Our forces were driven back, and at the same time, pressure from the north and the south was applied against our flanks. So as a result, by the night of the 22nd, our force was back pretty much in a semicircle around the town of Comanster. It should be pointed out that when the men were dispersed on the ground, they were like the fingers of a hand. And as they withdrew, as I later pointed out to them, they gained strength by coming back, as the fingers would, in forming a fist. This gave them strength and coordination. Comanster would be the last defense. From there, General Clark immediately sought an escape route to the west, a dirt road through the woods to Vielsalm. And although the Battle of the Bulge would last for another month, its turning point had been reached. The defense of places like Saint Vip had given the Allied armies what they needed, time to rally and regroup. Next morning, the skies were clear. The ground, which had been a sea of slush and mud that would have mired hopelessly the withdrawal of 23,000 men and their thousands of vehicles, was frozen hard. During the early morning hours of the 23rd, both CCB of the 7th Armored and CCB of the 9th Armored were hotly engaged with the enemy. It was difficult for them to disengage, but also during the day, the 82nd Airborne was attacked from the south. I finally sent a message to General Clark and General Hogue telling them that it was imperative that they start their withdrawal, because if they did not start now, they'd be withdrawing into a bunch of Germans instead of into the ranks of the 82nd Airborne Division. There was no time to issue formal orders or orders under code. So I instructed that the radio to all units under my command be opened up and that the orders would be given in the clear. General Hasbrook told me that I would have to withdraw across the Vielsam Bridge by noon or else the bridge would have to be blown because of the pressure of the German army coming in from his flanks. And I directed that the withdrawal would start immediately and would, the plan would be that, that they would withdraw down the dirt wood road on a first come, first served basis. This required that I personally direct traffic at the crossroads at uh, Comanster. So I started the battle as a military police, and I ended the battle as a military police. But of course, that was necessary. I met Bruce Clark in the town, where he was directing traffic at the time, trying to ease the confusion of the milling vehicles passing through. We went into position around the town. The withdrawal started at 7 a.m. and went on constantly throughout that day. It went very smoothly. The covering forces operated efficiently, and only one unit had trouble. That was Task Force Jones on the southern flank, the last to withdraw. 
So the American column passed through these little towns of Biho and Bovigny, and as they did, they became part of Task Force Jones, which was the rear guard of the American unit coming out of saint vith And my little platoon became part of the rear of the rear guard of the last unit out of saint vith As we fell back onto the road to Sam Chateau, I found it choked with vehicles from uh, a task force of the 7th Armored Division. We attempted to work our way through these vehicles to find out what the trouble was, and we found that there was a burning tank in Somme Chateau and that the Germans had apparently come around behind us with an anti-tank gun. In the meanwhile, someone had discovered a side road up a sort of a side canyon that went up this high mountain beside this Somme River. And just then, a beautiful thing happened. A full, bright moon came up over the hills. We went up this side road and then across country. And in one place, we had to detail some of the tanks of the 7th Armored Division to pull the wheel vehicles over, this, over a highland swamp. And uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, we finally wound up behind the 82nd Airborne Lines. Mile after mile, and we came out through the snow, this brilliant, beautiful moonlight night, and then we saw another wonderful sight. About every hundred feet or so, we saw a man in a white parka standing there, and that was the 82nd Airborne. And we came out through the 82nd Airborne Division, out of the Battle of uh, the Bulge, out of saint vit and that was Task Force Jones. We were the tail end of the rear guard of the 7th Armored Division. I climbed up the slope in there where I was greeted by General Hasbrook, drawn, tired, out on his feet, but still the type of a commander standing there with his troops to the very last minute, threw his arms around me and said, Boylan, thank God you got him out. And uh, toward the end, I figured that I got uh, practically no sleep for the last 72 hours before reporting to General Hasbrook behind the 82nd Airborne Lines. I wished him a Merry Christmas. It was the day before, but I wished him a Merry Christmas. But to us, it was just a big step to get home. I was and still am proud of the men and officers of the 106th Infantry Division with whom I went through such a dreadful bath of blood during this action. I was so proud, as a matter of fact, that I returned to that unit after escaping from prisoner of war camp some 28 days later. It is the war of the small men, the outpost commanders, the section commanders, the company commanders. Those were the decisive people here who were responsible for success or failure, victory or defeat. We depended upon their courage. They could not afford to get confused and had to act according to their own decisions until the higher command was again in a position to take over. I believe I can say, and I have the right to make this judgment, that the Germans did this admirably well. At the same time, however, I am also convinced that this was the case with the American forces, who, after all, succeeded in upsetting the entire time schedule, not only of the attacking unit in saint vit but also of the 5th and 6th Panzer armies. That is a fact which cannot be denied. Just one month later, in January, you can imagine how we felt the satisfaction of regaining what we had been forced to lose. There was snow on the ground. Small road leading down to the right, a few farmhouses and trees, and St. Vith itself. No movement, no noise, no dogs, no smoke. Lifeless, flattened. Such is the rush of history that Sanvith, Belgium, is almost lost in it now. But not in the memories of those who made history there that winter, or those who must take life up again when history is past. And then we came back, one by one. The first to return were my father and my elder brothers. But when we came back, things weren't over yet, by far. Everything was destroyed here. That wasn't too bad, 
Somehow children don't care too much for material values, but the destroyed tanks were a horror. Everywhere, sometimes there were still burned bodies inside. Soldiers, Germans, Americans. And when we were playing sometimes, or ventured into the woods, which was very dangerous, when we tried to jump across a trench or something, suddenly we saw, we were startled with horror because there was a body lying in there. But gradually things came back to normal, accidents were less frequent, and in time they were forgotten. And then it went on like that, and in spite of everything, we grew up and became strong. But still, something has remained. Sometimes when one talks about it, it comes back to one's memory, how awful it is. Well, one of the things that's always bothered me most about the Battle of San Luis is that a number of heroic actions went un unrecognized and unrewarded. Uh, of course, there were a good many silver stars and bronze stars awarded because I delegated that authority to my commanders and they carried them in their pockets and were authorized to put them on the man at the time. But the higher decorations, which many deserved, were not forthcoming because the sworn statements of witnesses were hard to get in the heat of battle. Afterwards, the witnesses were gone in some cases, and in others, the act was forgotten only too soon.